Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time to hop on with us today. We have a very relevant topic to speak to, especially moving into 2022. Um, and we have the right people here today to speak to this. They've taken the time out of their day to bless us with their expertise and knowledge. Um, so I'm super excited to learn. I'm here to learn from these guys um, and share any kind of uh, my own uh, insights as well. My name is Mikey Harrison. I'll be moderating the conversation today. I'm the Partnerships Manager at Sales Hacker. Um, so everybody, thank you so much for taking the time to join us because we do all of these for the community. Um, and uh, I'm really excited for an awesome conversation. So today, what we're talking about, very relevant, like I mentioned, moving into 2022, it seems like everybody is hiring right now. Um, so what we're, our topic today is faster onboarding equals faster results, reduce ramp time, um, a constant uh, conversation topic with all organizations. So really excited to hear what you guys have to say today um, and get into it. But before we dive into the juice of the conversation and I get our, our uh, panelists to introduce themselves, I would like to just uh, run through a few housekeeping things before we dive into it. Um, so first of all, like I mentioned, we do all of these for the community, um, for you guys. Um, so please, we always love to know who we're rocking with today, who's hanging out with us um, today. So please drop your name, um, where you're calling in from, your job title, LinkedIn profile, whatever you want in the chat so we can kind of start to see who's uh, who's hanging out with us um, and get the banter rolling with everybody uh, in the chat there. So um, please let us know who you're from, where you're calling in from. Uh, that would be fantastic. Um, we got Clay here from Chicago, um, John from Edmonton. Great stuff, guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, sweet. So that's that. Um, thirdly, I want to just remind everybody that um, we all know you're all very busy. It's an hour of your time is a good chunk of your, of your time. So um, we obviously would love if you guys hang with us for the entire hour. Um, but if you have to jump, no worries at all. Um, we are recording all of these, uh, these webinars and we will send you a recording of the, uh, the event post event through an email within about 24 hours of the event. Um, so no worries if you miss anything and you have to jump off, we'll get that over to you. You can catch up on anything you missed, share it with your peers, colleagues, whatever you want to do there. Um, so that's all good. Okay. Thirdly, and last but not least, um, if you look at the bottom of the chat, actually, I've got two more things. Sorry about that. If you look at the bottom of the chat, there's a little blue kind of box that says, um, I think it might only say panelists for you and attendees for the attendees. If you click that and change it to host and panelists and everyone, then the reason for that is our panelists will be able to monitor the chat as well as the Q&A, just in case I'll be monitoring it um, quite uh, thoroughly, but if I miss anything, um, they might be able to hop in there and grab anything that I might have missed. Um, so please change that to everyone, host panelists. That would be fantastic. And then the most important one, um, the chat, we ideally will have a bunch of banter going through there. So if you have any questions that you want to ask this panel, please drop them in the Q&A, not in the chat. If you look at the bottom, there'll be the Q&A little uh, uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Any questions for these guys? This is your chance to ask these thought leaders uh, around anything that you're curious about. So please throw them in the Q&A, not the chat, because I can lose some stuff in the, in the banter in the chat um, if you have any questions. Okay, I'm sorry, that was boring. And now we are ready to rock and roll with all the good stuff. Okay, so before we get into the conversation, I want to introduce our panelists here today. Um, Lindsay, Catherine, and Chris, thank you so much for taking the hour today to bless us with your knowledge. Very happy for you guys to be here, welcome. Happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Cool, guys. Well, before we go into uh, the conversation, I do like to get a bit of background 
um, on each of you guys so we can get a bit more acquainted and kind of uh, get a bit more, um, get to know you a bit more for, for our audience. So Chris, I'll start off with you. Chris, the Director of Sales Development at Ambition. Um, do you please just give us a bit of background on yourself, uh, who yeah. you are, where you're coming from. Um, yeah. For sure. Well, thanks for everybody for joining today. This is going to be a fun, fun topic and conversation. Uh, like Mikey said, I'm with Ambition. We're sales performance management, coaching, and gamification platform for sales teams. Um, and I've been with Ambition for about two years, um, been managing sales teams for about six, um, and, and just really excited about this conversation today. It's, it's definitely near and dear to my heart. Fortunately, this year, we have quadrupled the size of Ambition's uh, sales development function. So I've been really focused on this topic uh, and trying to, to be the best onboarding uh, advocate as, as possible. So, Awesome. Chris, you say, do you say doubled? Quadrupled. Quadrupled. Yeah. Holy moly. We, we, we are a much smaller team than, than probably uh, Lindsay and Catherine have, but, uh, but still it's, it's quite a, quite a bit of scale for us. And we still have like nine positions open. So it's, uh, it's been wild. Fantastic. That's super exciting. I love being a part of a, the hyper growth stage there. Right. So um, Chris, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. I'm super excited to hear what you have to say as well. Okay, moving on. Lindsay. Lindsay Boggs is the Global Director of Sales at Lucid Works. Lindsay, please just give us a bit of background on yourself. And again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I've been in sales for over a decade. I've been in sales leadership for a, over half of that time. Um, I've been at Lucid Works since June. I have a team of nine SDRs and we cover all of the US, LATAM, Canada and UK. And um, I'm really excited to be here and talk about this topic. Cool. Awesome. I'm excited to have you and learn from you. Um, so thank you again for taking the time. And last but not least, Catherine Wilson. She's the Senior Manager at Global Solutions of Onboarding Strategy at Salesforce. Um, Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. And um, please just give us a bit of uh, background on yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, as, as you said, my uh, title is uh, global solutions onboarding at Salesforce. So I actually represent more of the solution side of this conversation. However, my entire career has been spent in onboarding minus the tiny stint I did as an SE. Um, and I love, I live and breathe all things onboarding. Um, I, I love the psychology behind it. I think this past two years has been really interesting to see how the market's adjusted and how everyone has now is now having this conversation. Um, so I'm super happy to share, you know, what I've learned over the last six and a half years. Um, and yeah, super happy to be here. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here, Catherine. I really, um, we appreciate it. And, uh, again, thank you all three for, for taking the time today. I know an hour here today is big. Um, so that's fantastic. I'm super excited to jump into it. Um, okay. So. Before we launch and dive into the conversation, we're gonna have a very organic conversation. Um, and everyone remember, we do these guys for you. So if you have any questions, this is your chance um, to throw it in the Q and A and ask these, uh, these panelists. Um, plus we always find that that drives the most engaging conversation. So please, any questions in the Q and A, fantastic. Now, before we dive into our first topic of discussion, I do want to run a quick poll just to get a bit of a pulse on how, you know, everybody else is kind of uh, working out their, their onboarding process. So um, I'm going to quickly launch it here. So average ramp time, what's the average ramp time at your organization? Um, I'll give a, a couple minutes here just to, uh, to get it. Um, what guys, what do you think is going to be uh, the, the number one? We got two weeks, three weeks, one month. I feel like longer. one month is like, is the, I don't know, either one month or longer. Those are going to be split. That's what I would say. I'm going with three weeks. Three weeks. Oh, it's looking pretty, uh, pretty close here. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of with you on the one month to maybe longer. Um, I, I know I mentioned in the beginning of the, uh, the, the, in our pre-call here that you know, I've been on both sides where it's get thrown directly into it, you know, within two weeks or take a long period to really understand the product before you go for it. So, um, you know, I'm not really sure what the best process is. 
I can kind of say what has worked best for me, but as a Which whole- one of those did you do first? Because I feel like if you got through, if you've ever been thrown in, you kind of can't go back from that. Like, I, you know, like you crave that after that. So did you, which so one was I, first? You're right. So the first one I was, it was a month long. So it was a three week, three to four week period of just understanding what we're doing and then just getting thrown into it. Whereas uh, most recently was kind of uh, a two week, I was on calls from my first day and then pretty much just slowly started taking them on, um, which I don't know. I, you know, I think there was greatness to both of them, right? So um, I'm not too, too sure what is the right way, but um, cool. Okay, so we have about, I'll give it about 10 more seconds here before I end the poll and we can see what we got here. Okay. I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> can, can you guys, okay, I'll just, just share the results here. So as you can see, 41% said longer. Um, it'd be great to throw in the chat, understand how long, if you did vote for, for longer. Um, but then again, yeah, it does look like one month or longer is the average there, which, you know, I think- That makes my heart happy. Yeah, makes for, sense. Right? That makes my heart happy. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, good. Um, cool, well, thank you all for participating in that. Just, it's great to kind of get an understanding of the pulse in the room. Um, and uh, let's dive into it here, okay? So- Okay, to start this conversation off, I wanna start off with, uh, to get an understanding from you guys. Um, you know, how, how have you been able to create onboarding experiences? You know, I know a lot of um, onboarding experiences at many, uh, many organizations tend to, um, you know, utilize the same onboarding process for each cohort of new um, individuals coming on. How have you been able to differentiate that onboarding process? Like, do you go, do you put all your reps through the same process? Um, do you try and maximize that process to focus on their skills and strengths? Um, what does that look like for you? And I'll, I'll start off with Chris there. Yeah, I think for us, it's been a, a bit of a hybrid approach. Um, so certainly in the process, there's things that are, are pretty standard for us. So we have a playbook uh, that outlines most of the procedures that uh, are going to be really important to success in the role. And so we have them, you know, really digging into that playbook and that, that process is pretty standard. Um, so I would say in general, week one is, is very uh, somewhat scripted. Um, and then throughout that week, we begin really doing some discovery on um, based on these individuals, prior skill sets, kind of what they're bringing to the table what are some of their strengths and weaknesses? And then how do we need to pivot in week two to really address some of those things they may be uh, struggling with or cut back on the things they may be doing really well? Um, so that's, that's kind of how we've approached it is, is week one is, is pretty standard and scripted. And mm -hmm. then we pivot for, for future weeks uh, based on uh, how week one went. Got it. So the first week is kind of more um, product knowledge, understanding everything, and then you kind of start to focus in on the actual skill sets. That's right. They'll do a lot of shadowing and, and uh, role playing and things like that uh, beginning in week two. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's been pretty similar to my experiences as well. Catherine, do you have anything uh, to add to that? Yeah. So, it, and it's, I've been in both situations where, you know, I, you want things to be as high touch and as one-on-one -on -one as possible, right? The end goal, a dream world would be every single person gets a completely unique individualized to them for their experience plan. However, that's not scalable. Um, and it's not necessarily best practice for consistency. So, um, you know, my research brain says that I really do like to have some sort of controlling variable across onboarding to say, is it what's what part of this is is working or not? Is it the content? Is it um, the you know the activities? Is it the curriculum? Or is it in fact the manager that's actually the reason that this person's might have been so successful? Um, so, but keeping some things the same across also allows you to see um, you know how different personalities and different levels of experience come into play. I I don't necessarily love the one size fits all because it's not fun if you're coming in you know, potentially with 20 years of experience from a competitor 
and you know, I don't want you to have the exact same onboarding experience as someone who has never done this before. You know, this is their first job or they just switched from a different industry. Um, so it's it's a huge balance. I know that the, the classic consulting answer is it depends. Um, but I do really like a I like a consistent plan, you know, knowing that managers and or the individual themselves are going to flex based on how things are going. So I really like what you said with, you know, you, you kind of flex things based on how they're doing. I love the idea of um, some sort of stand and deliver some sort of um, assessment there. I think keeping the the curriculum constant, but then allowing, you know, the use cases or the feedback or the style to flex based on the individual is really where you hit the sweet spot. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a great approach. Have you guys, have you ever, um, so for, uh, for, for one time for me, I was like tested on almost like a, a weekly <laughs> basis, um, to see where I was at almost. Have, have you ever utilized something like that? That's see, to me, that's like way overkill. Um, for so many reasons, one, my first question is, I would love to see what they did with that. You know, what were they, where, where did that data live? Did they ever use it? Were they ever looking at, you know, the answers? It's the same with, you know, weekly feedback or daily feedback. If you're not going to use it, don't ask for it. Um, and two, man, I bet you were so fatigued. And so, you know, knowing like when, when the end of the week came and you knew it was about to happen, like that's such an unfortunate place to be in during this experience. So I'm there for testing only when it makes sense and when it's to prove that a certain behavior has been reached. Um, not at all for, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I might not be popular in that opinion, but for me, like in onboarding and in enablement, I'm very picky about when I choose to test and assess. Got it. Yeah. You know, like it was, it was an interesting process for me um, coming out of, uh, it was like, it was because it was my first job at a university. So I was like, Hey, I feel like I'm kind of mm. in university for the first month. Yeah. It probably felt like university, <laughs> but it, it, you know, it, it was, it, it did work. You know, I was really, I was going to say, was, did you retain it? By the time I was on the, on, on calls, it was, it was there. It was, everything was kind of pretty locked in because I put so much energy into it, but um, I've had other processes that might have, you know, been better for my skill set per se, um, right? Um, Lindsay, I would love to hear your thoughts on you know the onboarding process and kind of what that looks like for you guys. Yeah, it was interesting with my onboarding process. We had um, two SDRs start with me on the exact same day, and so me, I like to know everything before I onboard people at the same time. So it was a little bit like. Oh my gosh, I'm not in control. I am not onboarding them. They are onboarding with me. So once I got my feet under me, I was able to onboard the next class of people. And it was, I felt more in control, if that makes sense. But a typical onboarding experience, I like to do low hanging fruit the first couple of weeks. So I like to make them feel like they're moving the needle on things they can control, um, like doing personal branding right out of the gate, doing LinkedIn makeovers. I'm looking at my sheet right now, um, learning business acumen. So a lot of the people that we are hiring are right out of college. So learning things like technology, just overall technology, how computers work, little like big things like that, mm -hmm. um, understanding understanding technology as a whole and just trying to move the needle a little bit at a time versus learning lucid works as a whole because putting them um, on gong right away could be completely overwhelming if they don't understand the words inside of gong that they're learning along the way teaching a class just on acronyms of what they're going to be hearing the next several weeks because i realized the first my first job at a college the first week somebody sent me an email saying, could you please send this to me EOD? And I was like, what is EOD? <laughs> and I got scolded for not knowing what EOD was. And I'll never forget that little things like that. You don't know what EOD means right out of college. And so I have to remember where people are coming from and put, put that lens on. Yeah. Especially in this, uh, this tech world, the acronyms are endless. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I TLA probably, probably is really of, kill you. Exactly. There's probably a bunch out there right now where I'm just like, what is that? And I've been in this world for a while, right? So it's like, it, uh, it, I totally uh, get that, uh, Lindsay. Um, so I did, in our poll, we did get a, a couple, of, actually a few answers that said two weeks in terms of, you know, onboarding process. Have you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's like, that's way too early? Or do you think there's some benefit to, 
you know, hopping on and getting thrown into the mix to kind of start getting reps in. Um, Chris, what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, a lot of that depends on what you might be selling. Um, you know, if the, if the solution is very technical uh, and, and maybe your buyer is, is a, you know, very technical buyer, um, you want the, the reps to feel very comfortable before they're pitching a very, you know, uh, difficult solution to sell. Yeah. I think if it's not as technical, I, I think there's a ton of value in going ahead and, and getting some live at bats early. Um, that's, you know, what I said, we do a lot of, uh, shadowing and, and role playing in week two. We also mix in there, uh, some live calls as well. And, uh, you know, certainly take our time and, and uh, do a lot of call coaching after, you know, a, a small uh, call blitz or something like that. But uh, I think there, there is some value in, in going ahead, getting into the, the live motion early on. Uh, mm -hmm. I've heard of some teams like even, you know, having them make calls, but not to prospects, um, ca calling to uh, other businesses and trying to sell them <laughs> something that you don't normally sell. Um, so I think there's a lot of creative strategies around just getting in that live, uh, in that live motion. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said around the, 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 the technical aspect of, um, the conversation, cause I've worked in security and compliance, which, you know, in a way I'm not an expert at that. So I don't really know the depth of what that goes into. So there was a lot more learning before hopping onto a call with somebody, right. Whereas, other areas where I've been on, it's not, it's pretty cut and dry. You kind of know what, what, it, what you're, you're kind of selling. So it's, you know, it did benefit to kind of hop right into it and start that, you know, getting reps, understanding what our prospects are, are asking us um, on a regular occurrence. Right. So I can kind of formulate a better structure. Um, but I totally agree with you there. Uh, Lindsay, what do you, what are your thoughts on kind of throwing reps into it right away like that? There's that phrase fail hard and fail fast. And I think there is some merit to that. Some people will oftentimes be, I think everyone can vouch for being incredibly nervous before your very, very first cold call. And sometimes people just want to rip the bandaid off and get it over with and just be done with it. And I'll never forget my first cold call. And I'm sure everyone on this call can remember their first cold call. So just get, get it done. Just be done with it. And the more you practice, there's, I, I tell my team all the time, you can rehearse and practice and role play for 12 months until you pick up the phone and actually make that very first cold call. That's when you learn the most. So there is some merit to picking up the phone sooner. Yeah. I love that. And Nathan uh, Greenspan in the chat just posted, I, I just pretend that I'm calling my grandma. I love that. I love you that. You must have a really <laughs> hip and grandma. Another, <laughs> yeah. Another, another thing that I like to think of too, when I am doing that is the fact that there's a, it's a person on the other side of the line, right? It's not, you know, it's just another person like you, right? So you yeah. know, treat them like another person, right? right. And that's, I just, I've always found it being um, a lot more organic and fluid instead of being like, Hey, I'm calling you out of the blue and I want to sell you something. Um, so yeah, I, I like that approach. And another thing too, is, you know, after a bad cold call, the number one thing you can do is pick up the phone and make your next one. Right. Um, because then you're just going to continue to, you know, you'll move past that much faster, to say the least. Right. Cause the more you sit in it and think about it, the more you psych yourself out. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, what about your, what about, what about you, uh, Catherine on the, on the kind so of, I'm, I'm like pretty against just blanket. Like I need to have someone onboarded in this amount of weeks. So to me, you know, whenever I hear that from a leader or from a manager, my first thought is, you know, what's behind that? Like what, what's the reason what, mm -hmm. for this arbitrary date? However, I do think, you know, where, what you can do in two weeks or in a short amount of time is to, is to your point, Lindsay, think about like, you know, what is the, what is the, the goal of what do I want out of this two weeks? And then how many practice reps can we get in before then? So I think that's where, where you start the conversation is like, what do I want out of whatever this, you know, period looks like? And then backing into, okay, how do I make sure that when, when that day comes, if we're going to do that, that this person is ready to succeed and we've set them up for success. I, 
I, I practice on anything, you know, the, the person behind you. Um, I, I think the best sales reps and the, the ones that I, when I meet right away and I know coming in when I see them in onboarding are the ones that can, they're so comfortable with just slipping into role play in the middle of a conversation. And that's when I know like, all right, you, you're like, if you're not ready, you're, you're so confident that the prospect will think you're ready. You know, everyone will know you're ready. Yeah. Um, and so to that point, it's, it's once you're, it's once you you understand what you want out of it, if it's two weeks, okay. So is that a cold call in two weeks? Is that, are, are we having a, a first opti meeting? Are we, are we doing like a, what is this? Uh, and then backing into that to say, let's get you as many at bats as possible. That's really the name of the game with onboarding is low risk. Very, very, sorry, I should add that asterisk, low risk at bats. I'll say my first day at Salesforce as a solutions engineer, I went to go shadow, um, which is a hilarious, you don't shadow like a trade event, a shadow a booth. Um, and you don't shadow a booth. I'm laughing because literally people were walking up to me asking questions and I'm like, hi, it's day one for me. Um, so by the end of the day, I mean, I said a lot of lies on accident, but by the end of the day, I'd memorized the guy standing next to me's pitch and was able to give it and was able to, you know, ruminate it on the way home and learned what I was actually saying. So it's possible, like the, the worst thing that'll come out of throwing your feet to the fire is you get a little bit burnt, but if, if you can't, like, I, I think that's also a really good, um, and you know, I'm not saying we should haze people. I'm not, I'm not throwing that out there, but understanding how someone reacts to that situation to that very first time, um, is, is really telling too. Um, so I, I definitely don't. Uh, recommend putting people in uncomfortable situations just for the sake of it. Yeah. Um, but it's really not that scary once you're in it. Cause like you said, Mikey, we're all just talking to people who have a job just like us. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. And to add to what you just mentioned there about, you know, a booth and Jamie even mentioned it, a booth is one of the best way to workshop a pitch that couldn't be more true. I remember my first time going to a conference and it's like in that one day I did the pitch maybe upwards of 250 times. So then you start to kind of alter it to be like, okay, what worked and what didn't? Okay, this is much, mm -hmm. much more to succinct. And then you kind of start to do that. And then once I went back to an office, it was kind of much more, you know, structured and not structured, but just clean cut, right? And it's like mm -hmm. point and just much more effective, right? Um, I think I told someone at that time I was working in our small business segment, which was like companies with 500 employees or less. And I told someone that I worked with companies, any company that had 500,000 employees or less, which is like, every company yeah. um so it just you know you brush it off you it's low risk little like you know diet sized at bats with low risk is is the the best way to do anything in two weeks if you have to yeah totally and I even started doing them like in my personal life right so it's like even when I was just talking to my girlfriend or my 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 dad or something like that just kind of honing it in a bit even when they ask so what do you do right yeah. and I'm just like there's there's an at bat yeah, great question. That's one thing I tell my reps all the time is maybe when they get to week three or week four, they feel like they start knowing the product really well. They start using a bunch of jargon. Uh, and I say, hey, your prospect doesn't know what you're talking about here. You know, how do you describe this solution to your mom? You know, if they'd ask you, like, where do you work again? Like, what do you do? Mm -hmm. that, that should be a little bit closer to what your pitch is than all this jargon. Totally. Right. I, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, before we move on to our next uh, topic here, I just want one more question that's more for myself. Um, have you ever utilized in the past like a buddy system, right? Where SVRs with AEs or, you know, AEs with success managers or something like that. Has that, have you ever used that? Have you ever utilized that kind of process? Because I know um, for some other call or some other friends of mine, peers and so on, they are matched directly with an account executive and that's how they go about. Um, Lindsay, have you ever kind of experienced that process? I have, but I have found that when it's assigned, it's not as effective as when it's organic. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. When it's organic, it's much more um, effective because they have sought out an AE that they just mesh better with than the one that I assign them to. Um, so what up for whatever reason, it's worked better when I say, go reach out to all of the AEs and introduce yourself. And then whichever, you know, whichever conversation you seem to 
remember the most or whichever one you seem to align with the most, I want you to, you know, continue that, you know, cadence and work with them. Um, you know, but you're going to always have a dedicated AE you're going to work with, but I want you to partner with them more and pick their brain and, and create a buddy system. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I've even noticed too, is like, if you are working with a technical kind of product and multiple offerings, some might be more knowledgeable and more equipped for certain areas. Right. So attach, attaching on to those, um, for those specific conversations, I think can be super helpful as well. Um, sure. Chris, what are you, what are you, what what are your thoughts on that? Have you ever experienced kind of uh, the the buddy system per se? Yeah, I think this is extremely valuable, um, especially now that we're not all in the office together, or many of us are not. Um, having that go to person who is not your manager uh, that you can uh, ask really any question to is is super important. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't kicked this off yet, but the next iteration of that here at Ambition. Uh, fortunately, my idea is to connect a, a brand new SDR with a, uh, an SDR here at the company who's been promoted into uh, another role, maybe AE or, or CSM, uh, so that they directly have that perspective of, hey, I've been in this role actually recently, I've been promoted out of this role, um, here's what it takes to be successful. So that's, that's kind of the next version that, I, that I'd like to implement here. Yeah, cool. I love that. That's, uh, that's awesome. Catherine, what are you, what are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's actually the buddy system or pairing or mentors or, you know, onboarding buddies. That's something I will not, not use, you know, like it, I don't create an onboarding plan that doesn't have either one, uh, someone, one person or multiple people that are assigned throughout, um, with very specific roles and responsibilities. So, Hey, I've chosen you for this. Um, you know, I, I want you to connect on this, on this aspect. Um, I also find that I really like what I really like your approach, Lindsay, with the kind of more organic, because that's also a really great way for them to kind of pitch themselves and understand, you know, how they connect with different people. Um, I've used it in the past as also a really good um, kind of leadership test for someone who wants to be in management or wants to be more of a senior lead, a senior sales rep to say, okay, if you, you know, if, if that's something that you see in your future, then we're, I'm going to give, I'm going to offload some of this onboarding excuse me, onto you. Um, I also, I think it's most successful when paired with a network. So, and this is something that I think no manager should, every manager should be doing this where, you know, when I have someone coming in, I've got a list of people from across the company that I've already asked, are you open to having a conversation with my new rep? Mm -hmm. um, and when you guys are talking, I've again, I've specifically chosen you for this reason. I want you to talk about this from from you, I want him to learn X. And then that also creates accountability on, you know, afterwards, what did you learn from this person? So kind of doing both of, I'm assigning you one person that's going to be your go-to. I think it's so necessary to have someone outside of a manager because we all, I mean, when I, anytime I'm new, I purposely spread my questions out to as many people as I can. So one person doesn't know how stupid I am. <laughs> and that's what I tell every rep to do. It's A, because you're going to learn ask the same question to different people, but, you know, spread it out and learn what they know and what they're bringing to the table. It then creates this organic network that you have for the rest of your career, you know? Um, so to me, it's, it's when you put those two, two things together, the buddy system, I love the cross-functional buddy systems of, Hey, I want you to AE. I want you to shadow an SE. I want you to shadow a CSM because you need to know what happens when the account's in red or when the account's in trouble. You need to know what happens when you punt, you know, you punt the ball over here. You need to understand why, why product tells you not to say this thing that you always want to say. You know, like the, the wider that they can have roots in, the earlier is also what will keep them more uh, actually committed to the company too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like utilize the assets, right? People are there to help. Um, you know, they want this company to be successful. So they want their reps and SDRs and AEs to be just as successful, right? So, mm -hmm. and you're so right, the SDR conversation to the account executive conversation to the success conversation is very different. So if you understand how those work, then you can actually build the, you know, the groundwork and the expectations moving into the next steps, right? Mm -hmm. um, We've so also, sorry, in the 
in the commercial space where, you know, the deals are a little bit smaller. One thing I've also seen really well done, one of my favorite RVPs, it was understood that if you were a formal onboarding buddy, you would be splitting deals with your onboarding buddy and, you know, for a certain amount of time. So it was a way to make sure that the account doesn't, the opti doesn't fail. It's low risk. We've always got, you know, a safety net here. This person is financially getting something out of helping, you know, they're, there's, they're in the, they've got skin in the game too. So they don't want to see this fail. Uh, and doing that slowly, you know, tapering that off so that A, the risk is low, B, um, they get a chance to shine too. I, I think some people kind of, you know, shy away from, I don't, you know, I don't want to lose any of my commission. Um, it, it's, it also just fosters this entire culture of inclusivity and, you know, learning from the get-go. But I've seen reps do that in one of my RVPs did that very successfully. Cool. Awesome. Love that. Um, I've got a question in the Q&A here from Clarissa. What kind of soft skills do you teach to someone who's an experienced seller and not new to the industry? Chris, do you want to take a stab at that one? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, the first few things that, that come to mind here is just, um, you know, if someone comes in with a level of experience, like I think it's super important uh, that they're coachable from day one, because sure, they have a lot of experience from whatever industry or, or whatever that came before, but things could be different in this environment. So I think the mindset of um, being open to learn uh, and, and listen is, is really important for, for someone in that seat. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Totally. No, I, 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 I totally agree. Um, Lindsay, do you have any thoughts on that? That was the thing that I was going to say. Um, I'll have to think of something else. I would, um, I would say being vulnerable on accepting and giving feedback would be another one. Um, being able to show up to a call review and know that it's a safe space and knowing that we are all in this together and being able to bring a call, digest it, understand that it's a safe space and being open to feedback and receiving feedback and giving feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Catherine, anything on, on that one to add? Uh, they both just like the only thing I would add is really just um, there's a certain way that, you know, when we say soft skills, we all have like, you know, ideas in mind of is it presenting? Is it communication? Is it business acumen? Um, every company has their flavor of doing that. And that's really what you're there to learn. So I think to it's very, it's important to have a healthy dose of acknowledgement that you, you know, the reason we hired you, the reason we are expending, you know, the, the cost of onboarding you as a person is because you're experienced and, you know, we acknowledge these things about you. However, there's a, there's a way that we like to do things here. Um, I'm not saying your way is not valid, but again, there's a way we like to do things here. We want you to be open to that, have a healthy dose of bringing your experience in. But I think that's really the way I've framed soft skills in the past with folks who, you know, come in with more experience than I'm a, I have in years of being alive. Um, and so that's really my, my way of, of kind of coding that is, but I think what soft skills, it's really, you know, presenting, they're now the face of your company and the face of your product. So that's, can you have a, a lucid conversation an independent conversation um, with a goal and an ask afterwards? Um, and just really how your company does that is the only difference between all of this, right? Yeah. Totally. And that's the thing too, as an SDR, you are the face of the company, right? You're mm -hmm. the first interaction that they're having. So, um, you know, we want, you want that to be as impactful as, as possible. Right. Um, okay. I want to talk about the tech stack when onboarding. Um, okay. So I know this is super crucial, especially in this hybrid world, right? Working from home. I feel like the tech that is used for onboarding is even more so than it was pre pandemic. So I would love to, I'll start off with you, Lindsay, because I know you mentioned, you know, um, using Gong and throwing your reps right into that. Um, what does the tech stack look like, you know, for, for, for your team to help aid the, the, the ramping period? Um, you know, like how important is the proper tech um, for your reps when onboarding them? 
Yeah, it's definitely very important. Um, we use Gong, like I mentioned, we use um, something called Work Patterns, which helps with onboarding, tracking their assignments that are due, tracking tasks that are due, um, tracking our one-on-ones and um, our staff meetings. We have a sales automation platform, of course. Um, we have Salesforce, of course, and um, Asana. So lots of different tech stacks that we have. Um, but I would say the, the norm is that we use them on a consistent basis and frequent feedback is also important for me. And that's how we use work patterns. Um, and definitely daily check-ins, daily huddles, communication is key. Got it. And do you does, do, do most of the, you know, when you're, you're bringing in a new cohort of reps, do they all utilize the same process and the same kind of uh, stack throughout, throughout, throughout that? Yeah, yes, they do. And my ultimate goal is to bring in SDRs at the same time. Um, and I would be curious to hear from Chris and Catherine too, if you bring in cohorts at the same time. I, I really prefer to bring in people at the same time versus hiring a one-off because it's so much easier to bring in people together versus a one-off. So it's curious to hear from them as well. Cost the same amount of time. Yeah, exactly. And then you also, you, you also have that, um, you know, that you have somebody in the same position as yeah. you, you can kind of go back and forth with, try and kind of they have a buddy, <laughs> like the buddy system, except yeah. at the same level. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Chris, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yep. It's, I mean, it, it's, if you have the luxury of, of bringing people in in cohorts, like definitely do that. Um, to your point, Mikey, like the camaraderie that's built uh, mm -hmm. is so crucial there with that class. And then we will use that to like run competitions and, and whatnot and like mm -hmm. uh, say, okay, well, you guys are a team now and you're going to be competing against uh, some more veteran reps and, and all, we'll, we'll make it even. But, uh, but yeah, it, it goes a long way for them to have that, that buddy system early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I'm a, I've always been a very competitive person growing up playing sports and, and all that stuff too. So um, I definitely thrive when I have, you know, someone to work against, but also, you know, it's not, it's not all competitive. We all want to be as successful as possible and you want your, your peers to be as well, but having that extra kind of push, you know, we're all seeing each other. How many meetings have you booked? I booked this. Okay. I got to ramp it up here, you know? So it's, um, it's good. Um, like that, uh, Catherine, what do you, what are your, what are your thoughts there? I, I love a cohort. I, I live for a cohort. Um, I've for so many reasons, the camaraderie, hundred percent, the scalability, hundred percent. Um, and you know, we're talking about people getting at bats at sales as an onboarder. I also need at bats to learn. So the more, the more people or kind of, you know, mini micro experiments, kind of getting pig groups I can do to learn from, the better. Um, because the one-offs don't, I don't know if their experience is different because that's them. I don't know if it's it's because of the time of year. Um, so I, I love a cohort. Um, I, Chris, I also really want to learn more about, I want to, I want to hear your answer to the tech stack question because correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, you, you, that is your company and in, in, in yeah. essence, yeah. um, I love the, I love the idea of gamification. So I, I want to hear, you know, what, what you do or kind of your pitch on your company, why, why I should be using your company. <laughs> why? Thank you. I'm telling you my list, yeah. of, my list of tech, I'll, I'll, I'll answer after you. My list of tech is not very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, to, to, to answer your question, uh, it's been a huge benefit for us using our own tool. Um, and, and I'll, I won't talk forever, but I'll go through the kind of like the main highlight points. So number one, I think it's so important for onboarding reps to have a clear understanding of what a good day and what a bad day looks like for them. Mm. So when they finish that first day, like, did I do well today? And so we, you know, your organization, like figure out what are those like KPIs that they have control over early on. It might be modules completed or, you know, things like that all the way working up to week two, it's how many demos did you sit on or how many cold calls did you make? How many emails did you send? I think, you know, what Ambition will help do is scorecard all that out for you. And those scorecards can ramp up based on where you expect them to be week one, week two, week three. And so it gives that clear picture on a weighted scale of zero to a hundred 
and you can put multiple metrics in there on what a good day and what a bad day looks like. So they're shooting for a hundred uh, score on their scorecard on a daily basis. And so that's the first thing is just being really clear about what good looks like early on in the role. I love um, that. The number two, and I think this is maybe the, one of the most important pieces is celebrating early wins because you know, those SDRs are not going to be setting meetings, you know, in week two, week three, maybe not even week four. Um, some are, but uh, so I think we, you, with Ambitious Platform, you could send alerts to Slack or Microsoft Teams that celebrate, hey, you know, Nolan added 30 prospects into a sequence today. Like for him, that was his prospecting goal. You know, let's, let's shout him out for that. Uh, his first, his first meeting set, like, let's make a big deal about that first pipeline opportunity. And so, uh, celebrating those wins early on, uh, cause Mikey's point earlier, you can, you can, you know, go for a week without setting a meeting and you start thinking in your head, maybe I'm bad at this. Like maybe I'm not cut out for sales. Um, but those little wins that you celebrate are going to keep them in the game, you know, keeping them wanting more. So that's the second piece. And then the third function of the platform that's super beneficial is the one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, platform. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna help document those conversations, track progress over time, uh, and just making sure that, you know, the rep is, is having that, you know, good one-on-one -on -one time with their, with their manager. And, you know, to Lindsay's point, like we integrate with Gong as well. So we could pull in those call recordings uh, so that you can coach live within so the it's platform. like a container that kind of I really like what you, I love what you said at the beginning about it's so important to know what a good day and a bad day is and the idea of like a tech platform or just you know whether it's a, a, a someone telling you on a piece of paper or just something that says this is what you're supposed to feel like at the end of the day if you've done these things and that it tracks that I think like when I think about tech that's one of the the two the the things that you guys have mentioned one, you know, Gong being able to to service like the okay, how do I actually perform as a sales rep? Um, I we look for I definitely rely heavily on on especially in this remote world like a, a virtual stand and deliver, right? Like we I think we use Level Jump. Um, I'm not entirely sure why we as a company decided to make that choice. Also, like just asterisk safe harbor. I represent no financial. Uh, statements or whatever of Salesforce. Um, no idea why we, and it, it allows us to say, hey, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a practice scenario. You know, it's not just gonna be, and we're gonna record it and we're gonna put it in a place where other people can see it and comment on it. So some sort of stand and deliver is huge for us. Um, and then I actually, I'd be interested to hear how you use Salesforce, uh, Lindsay. I've used it not only for tracking activities and just showing them literally this is where you're gonna be selling and how you're gonna be living your day, but also as a learner CRM. So whether it's Salesforce or a Google Sheet or Excel or some sort of document, um, I, whatever the tech is, the thing I want it to do is catalog who are my learner, who are my onboarders and what's their progress like over time. So if, you know, when did they start? Um, when are they, what the, what's the date they're supposed to be hitting certain milestones? Have they done those? Have they not? Um, kind of as a collective, you know, if, if a manager wants to pipe in and say, hey, um, you know, Mikey, I, I shadowed a, a call you were on last week and I, I saw you did really well. How long have, you know, when did you get hired? What, what have you done? Um, or vice versa, uh, Mikey, I, I shadowed a call and man, I, I really think you could use some more practice in this and going back and looking at that record and saying, oh, well, he spent like 16 hours in presenting with a purpose. Um, I, I think someone needs to talk to Mikey about presenting with purpose, um, that kind of stuff. So just the tech for me is really like, does it do something that I need it to? Does it facilitate a conversation and does it track that conversation? Um, and, and to your point, assessing, you know, someone's performance or someone's progress. Yeah. But as I mentioned, my, my list is very, um, you know, Salesforce, Google Sheets, or we use Quip, um, which, you know, allows you to be collaborative. Um, and any sort of learn LMS, I would say, if you're looking for a tech or, you know, if when you're evaluating tech, LMS is obviously very important in onboarding, but when, when you're doing so, make sure to look at the ability to track against some sort of curriculum or some sort of um, ability to say, did they complete this? And then how does this completion of this thing tie to 
you know, their individual record. That's really what I think about. I, I can't help myself when, as an SE, um, but digging into, you know, how things are integrated and related in that area. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so I, I know like a lot of reps that when they're coming on to a new organization from where they've been in the past um, and what they've used in the past, right? So for instance, they use a different CRM than what your company would do or a different engagement process that you that your company would do. Have you ever made exceptions to bring on tech for, for those people that you know are you used to using this and will be probably like ramping and performing quicker because they already know how to utilize all of that tech outside of what you currently are using, or is that a no-go at your what do you I'll uh, I'll start with with Lindsay there. Uh, I have a situation right now where somebody has been used to using a certain platform where I'm evaluating it because of that, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm not discounting it at all because I think it's great. Um, I'm evaluating it and it's yeah. because of this person that I'm looking at it. Um, so we might, we might actually end up going with it because of this person's experience with it. So I, I'm all, I'm all about listening to my, my, my reps because they're the most experienced with what's out there. Yeah. And I think also, even in this, like, again, in this remote world, onboarding has become quite difficult too. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would think that maybe that could play a role into kind of opening up, you know, the horizons to potentially new tech that has been used less, lesser, um, involvement per se, in terms of teaching the tech on how to use it and more on kind of, okay, here's product. This is what we need to do. And this is how we're going to, we're going to go about it. Um, Chris, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, never encountered that scenario myself. Um, but like Lindsay said, I'd be open to it, you know, depending on the type of solution. Um, you know, it'd be hard to make big changes to, uh, tools that are really embedded yeah. in your process, but if it's a lighter weight tool, potentially. Yeah. Got it. And I, I I'm just, uh, I'm assuming, um, Catherine, that you're probably on the similar boat as Chris. Uh, no, I would say, I mean, total, I, I like cringe when I hear that from, you know, the position that I've kind of been trained in and spending, spending six and a half years at Salesforce. There's like absolutely no way that we would, you know, adopt something because of one person, hundred yeah. percent open to like, oh, what's the benefit of that? But the likelihood of that reaching the level of procurement uh, is <laughs> nothing. Um, and more than that, I guess there are, there are massive security implications when it comes to um, something that's not licensed or not, you know, vetted yeah. by, uh, so for those reasons, I, I, also being like a security compliant data nerd, my, my skin crawls a little bit when I think about like someone deciding to, you know, run a call or do anything from their own personal account uh, from something super open to, oh, that's, you know, from a doing my job better day to day. Did that thing help you do this, you know, track your activities better? If it's licensed, cool. That's great if it's vetted, but um, yeah, that's a no for me, dog. Yeah, <laughs> no, I love it. And, and I get it. I totally, I agree. Right. The reason, the only reason why I asked is I had a conversation <laughs> a couple of weeks ago with a, 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 a colleague or a peer of mine and a big deciding factor on going with a certain organization was the tech that they were using. Mm. Right? So I was like, okay, well, what if this rep is very, you know, you really want this person on your team, but the other company wants them as well and they have the stuff that they're used to so it's that's uh, i just was wondering if that's ever kind of come up in in but like put yourself i guess as any business owner yeah maybe this is why i'm not a business owner um <laughs> any business owner if if i have a sales rep who's kind of giving me an ultimatum from the get-go of like hey i'm gonna go with this other company because they use this tech that i'm used to like if that is so important to you that's that's great. And you have every right to make that decision for, you know, you coming to my company. However, this is the tech that I have chosen to purchase as a business owner is not up for negotiation. I guess when we're recruiting is, is more my ask, my, my response to that. Yeah. And you know what, I'm, I'm with you. I'm on your, I'm on the same page. And also, you know, for we're me, adults. 
for right for me though it's like the more tech and more stuff i'm actually familiar yep. with and can use the more valuable i am right so mm -hmm. um, you're gonna pay me to learn this cool exactly great and the more knowledgeable i'm in within the space too right because especially in this you know sales tech world you might be selling to a lot of the customers that you're actually using right so mm -hmm. um it can uh, it can really help there Okay, we got five minutes left, guys. And I do want to hop on to one kind of topic on the feedback aspect and you know how you guys go about that within your org to provide that constructive feedback to your, your reps and then also reps to their colleagues. Um, I know feedback is everything in terms of onboarding people. Um, I've been in both sides where I had over feedback too much and then some where it was never even there. So I didn't really know where to go. Um, how have you created a culture um, for protective feedback, um, productive feedback within for your reps, um, you know, within your your teams, and and so on? Um, Chris, I'll start with you there. Yeah, I mean, I think early on it's about setting the tone that um, you're there for feedback, um, positive or negative. Um, and so I think if you set that tone early, then uh, you know, not everybody's going to be open to it, but then providing multiple forums for them to give that feedback. We'll do anonymous surveys. Um, we'll, you know, get feedback from their mentor that they work with. Um, we've got one-on-one -on -one sessions with myself. Um, so we, we try to get it in a lot of different ways. I think one of the, the biggest challenges, I think, given the remote hybrid kind of work situation we're all in is what we've lost is that moment where you're sitting in the office with your coworkers and you've got a really small question and you're like, Hey, Catherine, how do you, how do you handle this? How do you, how do you do this? Right. And, and um, that's something that they're not particularly going to go slack their manager or slack their coworker to figure that out. And so that bit of feedback or that question just like sits there and doesn't get answered. And so I think, finding ways to even get the small things out uh, are really important. Um, one of the things I've, I tested was uh, doing like an office hours session. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a two hour block in the afternoon where I'm just on a Zoom call like this. You can pop in, you can pop out. Um, and just that they know that they can, you know, get any question answered at that point. Um, that was pretty effective. So I would just say like lean into that communication, that feedback, try to figure out how best to, to, to learn as much as you can from your reps. Yeah, totally. And that was the, that's the one thing that I can also relate to in terms of, you know, if you have a, like a question on products, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not a product manager, so I don't really know the ins and outs where, you know, back in the office, you can stand up, walk over, get the answer like that and have it in your follow-up email within, you know, 10 minutes, right? Whereas it can be a bit more difficult in the virtual virtual space. So um, I totally get that. Catherine, what are, what are your thoughts on, you know, providing a, a, a feedback loop for, for your- So first of all, I think it's super imperative to set the tone, as you mentioned up front, that like, this is going to be part, this isn't, you shouldn't be surprised when you get feedback, good and bad. This is, this is our culture, just set the stage. You don't know anything different. Um, but two, it also means that um, you have to give guidance to the company or to the team who's going to be giving feedback on this is what good feedback looks like. This is what productive feedback looks like. And then three, I, you know, to your point, Chris, we also, we lose the, you know, the swivel chair, like, what does this mean? Or how do I do this? We also lose the moments after a meeting when you're walking to the car, you're on the plane, you're talking about your debriefing and mm -hmm. you're like, how did that go? Or you, you had, we had all that time. To, to sit there and think about things and to, to talk about things through. Oh, you thought that that, I, you know, I really thought that that went well when you said that, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I encourage everyone to carve that out, um, knowing that, and I, I tell my reps, every time you're getting reverse shadowed as you're onboarding, that's a huge thing we do. Um, you know, I'm going to put someone that's experienced on the call, shadow you. We're going to block 15 minutes afterwards for, for just for feedback. Um, but I, I really push I really push my SEs. Um, you know, when we talk about feedback, you know, from a manager, from a from a peer, but also for me with SEs, I care a lot about feedback from my AEs. I want to know, hey, how did how did that go? You know, you know the customer. What was their response? You know, what were they thinking? So for my SEs, it's I'm pushing you. I, I want you to walk away from every demo 
with a post-it note of two things that you could have, that you did really well. And one thing, even if it's the tiniest, you know, you went too fast when you're introducing, when you're introducing yourself, something like that. So it's, it's, it's setting up the culture to feedback is going to happen. It's blocking the time to actually allow feedback to happen. And then it's also telling your reps like, Hey, this is also on you. Um, and if you don't think you're getting feedback, that's on you, you know, like come ask me and ask me not, Hey, how do you think I did? Give me a specific question on what, what, what part of this uh, presentation did you, did you want specific feedback on? Um, I think that's how you set the culture is, is, is that's, you know, that's what I've done in the past is yeah. it seemed to work. In creating like an open space, right. Where it's, you know, feel comfortable to come speak yep. to me, come, come ask me questions. I'm here. For Nothing's that. personal. Right. Yep. Exactly. Um, before I let you guys hop off, Lindsay, I would like to just get your thoughts on this as well, before we part ways, um, in terms of feedback, what have you been able to kind of create? I would say everything Chris and Catherine said for the sake of time, the one thing I would add is asking them how they like to receive feedback. You'd be surprised that some people like to receive feedback, um, written, some people like to receive it verbally. And so finding out the way that in which they like to receive feedback, um, for me has been really valuable. Um, I use work patterns to deliver feedback. I do videos for them, or I'll do written feedback or I'll give it verbally. And you'll be surprised that they'll write back and give you feedback as well. And that's really been helpful. Awesome. I love, I love that. that. Yeah, me too. That's great. Okay, guys. Well, we are at time. Um, Chris, Catherine, and Lindsay, thank you so much for taking the hour to speak with us and bless us with your knowledge. I learned a ton. I know our, our, our uh, attendees did as well. So um, again, I do want to thank Ambition for sponsoring this webinar. Go check them out. Go link with Chris or, or any of these, uh, these panelists. If you have any further questions, I'm sure if you get them on LinkedIn, send them a message, they'll be happy to answer. Um, and, uh, and yeah, thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. And really looking forward to doing it again soon. Yeah, Bye. thank you. Happy Thursday. Happy yeah. Friday Eve. <laughs> See you. Bye. See you.